Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Debrief on ABC News Live. I'm Kimberly Brooks. Thanks so much for joining us. Some dangerous wildfires blazing in Southern California. We're on the ground there. And President Trump was fired up at his Minnesota rally, so we have the latest from that. Plus, Ronan Farrow sits down with ABC for his first television interview. But first, here are your headlines. A state-owned Iranian oil tanker has been rocked by two unexplained explosions in the Gulf Sea, 60 miles from the Saudi port of Jeddah. No casualties have been reported, but oil has been leaking into the sea, and the ship's crew is fighting to bring the leak under control. The cause of the explosions is still being investigated. Negotiations continue between GM and striking workers. Negotiations broke off between the two sides overnight, but resumed this morning on day 25 of the strike. Video of a murder discovered on a memory card has led to an arrest in Alaska. Police in Anchorage made the chance discovery a few weeks ago, saying a woman told them she found the card lying in the street. Investigators say it contained pictures and video of a woman being beaten in a hotel last month. 48-year-old Brian Smith was arrested Wednesday, one week after the victim's remains were found along a highway. Had the citizen not called us after she found the video card, we would not have been able to solve this crime as quickly as we did. We learned overnight the victim has now been identified and Smith is being held on a $750,000 bail. It's the second spacewalk of the month, and astronauts Andrew Morgan and Christina Koch have floated outside the International Space Station to replace 12 aging solar array batteries with six more powerful lithium-ion power packs. All right, we begin in Southern California, ablaze with mandatory evacuations ordered late last night after a dangerous wildfire broke out in part of the state. It's hard to imagine even looking at these images. Um, over 4,000 acres scorched, the fire coming right up to homes and power lines, and another fire yesterday afternoon wiping out um, almost 74 structures in a mobile park home in Cala Mesa. So I want to bring in Wa uh, Will Carr, who's right there in Porter Ranch. Um, Will, good to see you. Um, you are geared up. Please tell us what's happening where you are. So, Kimberly, uh, this all broke out right before sunrise. Uh, this fire raced down this hillside. And I want to show you this home because we were standing right down the All right, I think we lost Will right there. Uh if we um, get him back, we'll come back to him. But I want to go to um, a press conference that actually happened this morning about the entire situation. So we'll take a listen to that first. These weather conditions are significant in terms of brush threat. The relative humidity has dropped down to as low as 3%. Right now, it's 7%. The winds were sustained about 20, 20 to 25 miles per hour with gusts over 50 miles per hour. So as you can imagine, the embers from the wind have been traveling a significant distance, which causes another fire to start. In terms of fire activity, we're at 0% containment. The size right now is 4,700 acres plus. We've calculated that the fire is moving at a rate of 800 acres per hour. All right, so I want to actually bring in Alex Stone, who's also in Porter Ranch, California, um, there on the ground. Alex, um, I know these, uh, the situation there is, is dangerous, so tell me what's happening where you are. Hey there, Kimberly. Yeah, this is an area right here where not far away from Will, where only a couple of hours ago we were seeing incredible flame activity right through this culvert of flames 50, 100 feet high, people in the Porter Ranch area, they were racing to get out of here. They woke up to fire. They were told go. It was every man and woman for him and herself. They may not have gotten an evacuation order. Nobody may have come to their door, but you were told if you feel like you're in danger, then just to, to get out of this area. Now, you can hear around me and see, it is still very, very windy, but the winds have died down quite a bit compared to this morning. And let me show you, there's still some of the the fire is is left behind in the trees down here there's a little bit more there are homes right up here the firefighters stopped to protect but uh, the la county fire department la city fire 
they left here just a couple of minutes ago. They were uh, digging fire line. They were putting water on this area, trying to make sure it doesn't spark back up. But it was very tense right here not that long ago. And have you been able to talk to any of the residents there? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty scary. Oh, yeah, they're scared. And, you know, we saw them in the height of it as we were coming in today. They were racing out to get out of here uh, and trying to get somewhere where it was safe. At that point, it was incredibly smoky. It was like a, a thick fog in this area. They're scared. They still don't know. This is an evacuation zone. Nobody but firefighters, police, and media are allowed in here right now. So a lot of folks are wondering, are their homes safe? Are they still standing? Now, I can tell you, as I've been driving around the, the area, and I'm just watching some fire over here that's beginning to, to flare up again. Uh, as I've been driving around, there are homes that have damage. There are a few that have a lot of damage. I have not seen any that are completely destroyed down to the ground, but uh, there is quite a bit of damage. Homes, there were a lot of very close calls, but there were also a lot of saves. Firefighters were able to save a lot of these homes with towering flames right behind them. All right, Alex, thank you so much. And I want to try to go back to Will really quick to see if we can um, get an idea of what's happening uh, with you there. Will, are you there? Yeah, Kimberly, you got me? Yes, I got you. Okay, so we are in Porter Ranch. What happened is right before sunrise today, this fire took off. The winds were pushed so strongly that an ember dropped on top of this house. We were just standing right down the corner when it happened, and that house went up like a matchstick. Fire crews were able to jump on top of it, but they really just had no chance. But they did a fantastic job of actually saving all of the homes in this surrounding area. One thing I want to point out to you is if you look to the left of that home, you can see all of these trees in this area. In California, there is a rule that you should have 100 feet of defensible space. That means for 100 feet around your home, you're supposed to clear all of the trees, all the shrubs, everything that could go up in a wildfire like this. You can see this home actually has trees pretty much leaning up against the walls of the home. So that's an example of uh, exactly what you don't want to do. It can show just how quickly these fires can go up. Now, this entire area is under mandatory evacuation, but some residents have decided not to leave. And there's actually a report that one man was out here uh, with a hose. He was watering down his house. And he ended up having a heart attack. That's an example of why first responders say when you need to go, please get out. Because what happened is some of the fire crews that were in this neighborhood actually had to go help that man while he's having a heart attack instead of being able to try to put the flames out on some of these homes. One major issue as well is the nearby interstates are just completely clogged because of this. CHP is doing everything they can to open up one lane so people can actually turn around. But when the winds pick back up in the coming hours, if uh, people are stuck on those interstates, we've seen in recent years the types of fires that can dance right along the interstate or jump onto the interstate and possibly burn some of those cars. So that's another potentially dangerous situation. And as I'm talking, these winds are once again picking up. We are in a red flag warning through the rest of the day. So this could just be the beginning, Kimberly. All right, Will, um, we hope everyone stays safe. Thank you for the report. Thank you so much. And guys, um, we're going to turn to an interesting development at the Southern District of New York court. Um, two men tied to Rudy Giuliani were arrested while en route to Europe on campaign finance charges. Their bond was set at $1 million, and they were reportedly assisted Giuliani in his efforts to investigate Joe Biden's family. So I'm joined by Aaron Katursky um, to break this down and uh, help us understand uh, who these men are. This is Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, who are charged with two others, Kimberly, in this indictment here. Uh, it's a campaign finance scheme to inject foreign money into the American political system, uh, namely money from a Ukrainian government official who was seeking to influence American policy in Ukraine. Mm. So it's right in the same neighborhood as all of the, what's being investigated now by uh, the House Intelligence Committee and others with regard to impeachment. That's what I was going to ask you. I was like, are the, this, this happening, these two men being arrested, tied into this impeachment inquiry? They're not tied directly, although we think that uh, congressional investigators were going to, at, at minimum, ask them for, for documents, if not for testimony. 
But there they were at Dulles Airport with one-way tickets out of the country mm. when federal prosecutors moved in to arrest them on this particular scheme. It involved $325,000 to a pro-Trump super PAC, a separate donation to Congressman Pete Sessions, and the whole idea was perhaps to get the then U.S. ambassador to Ukraine ousted. And Rudy Giuliani had the very same goal, believing that she was standing in the way of efforts to investigate Joe Biden and his son Hunter. So the question is, I mean, these two men have been arrested, but they're so closely linked to Giuliani. Is there a possibility that he would be indicted? I, I think this cannot be a comfortable place for Rudy Giuliani. His emissaries into Ukraine are now the ones that are under federal indictment. You could imagine a scenario where perhaps they flip and start cooperating with the government. And Rudy Giuliani, who was a prosecutor in the very district where the case was brought, could find himself to be a, a target. We're a ways away from that, but we know that investigators are interested in the relationship between these two men, Parnas and Fruman, and Giuliani. And quickly before you go, um, has President Trump responded because this is his personal attorney? In a telling way. Um, we should say Giuliani declined to comment to us. President Trump said that he didn't know the two men. Uh, there are pictures with, with them in President Trump, but the president says he takes pictures with everybody, so he mm -hmm. can't be sure, doesn't know anything about their fundraising activities. And when asked directly about his own lawyer's involvement in this, uh, about Giuliani's involvement, he sort of stood back and said, you're going to have to ask Rudy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, far from a defense of his own private lawyer. Wow. All right. Aaron Katursky uh, with the latest there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kimberly. And guys, um, as the impeachment proceedings heat up, President Trump also um, energized and angry at his campaign rally in Minnesota last night, the first campaign rally since the impeachment inquiry began, uh, using his time to fire off attacks against Democrats and his rivals. So take a listen. And your father was never considered smart. He was never considered a good senator. He was only a good vice president because he understood how to kiss Barack Obama's. All right, so this uh, rally was peaceful until it wasn't. Um, protesters were clashing with police and pepper spray was used in one incident. So I want to bring in Mona Kosar Abdi at the White House uh, with more details about this. Mona, good to see you. Um, want to ask you, what was his main message last night? Well, the president went on a political rampage, to say the least, Kimberly, taking aim mainly at his usual targets. He went after uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar in her home state of Minnesota, calling her a, quote, disgrace to our country, as well as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And the president definitely didn't hold back when it came to former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter, even as you heard there using uh, some explicit words at times as he uh, returned to unsubstantiated allegations of corruption, accused using the Bidens of, quote, getting rich while America got robbed. You asked what his message was. It was going back to what he's been alleging this whole time, which is that the Bidens had some uh, illegal activity, again, unsubstantiated claims uh, that they were involved in in Ukraine. And also the president uh, called the former vice president's uh, son, um, a loser. He suggested a new tagline that he said could possibly put on shirts, which is Where's Hunter? Uh, some chants broke out then, too, um, were some Where's Hunter chants. And Biden then struck back on Twitter shortly after midnight, saying that America is, quote, so much stronger than your weakness. Uh, so the president, again, um, you know, this comes as his uh, efforts to get. Uh, political dirt on his rival Joe Biden uh, is the basis of his impeachment inquiry. So uh, he looks like he's going back to that, and it's something that he will be using going forward to 2020. Yeah, a major fight ahead. And uh, before we go, um, you've also been monitoring the China trade war. That's right. So the president is set this afternoon to meet with China's top negotiator here at the White House. Uh, the president yesterday, when uh, talking about Thursday's talks, was quite optimistic. He says it went very well. And China has hinted that they, too, are willing to walk away with a partial deal ahead of that October 15th deadline. To remind you, that is when the U.S. plans to hike tariffs on $250 billion worth of Chinese goods um, and up from 25 percent to 30 percent. Meanwhile, the president, a 
aims to pressure China to increase their purchases of U.S. agricultural products because really what we've seen for the last 15 months during this trade war is really uh, tit-for-tat retaliatory moves where the president will threaten tariffs and China will respond. So hopefully this won't lead to a comprehensive plan likely, but at least it will lead to a partial plan where it will be a step in the right direction and markets already responding both uh, Asian and U.S. stocks uh, up in anticipation of this meeting. Kimberly. All right, Mona Kosar Abdi right there at the White House. Thank you for the updates. We appreciate that. And guys, we turn to the Middle East. Um, it's the third day of the incursion by Turkey, pushing deeper into northern Syria to fight against the Kurdish forces, an attack made possible after President Trump said he would withdraw U.S. troops that were allied with the Kurds in fighting ISIS. It's a move that has sparked international outrage and one with severe consequences because tens of thousands of Syrian residents are fleeing and a number of of civilians in both Turkey and Syria have been killed. And our Ian panel is on the ground, right there on the ground in northern Syria with the latest. Ian? This is a scene right now in northern Syria. The front line is down in that direction, and you can see these trucks going by, laden with people, with belongings. There's another one behind. You can see they've got their mattresses, they've got the rugs there, families, women, children, babies. And the reason they're doing that is because Turkey is bombarding the area down the road with artillery, with airstrikes, and we're seeing a constant stream of vans going by. People desperate to flee, people with nowhere to go. We're now in day three of these strikes taking place against the people who used to be the West's allies. These were the people who fought and died against ISIS. They lost 11,000 young men and women in that battle, allied together with American forces. And what I'm hearing from people on the ground is asking the same question. Why has America betrayed us? We need America to come to our help. Just to remind you, this was triggered after a phone call between President Trump and President Erdogan of Turkey. We don't know the substance of that phone call other than it resulted in the withdrawal of 150 U.S. troops from that border area who were effectively acting as a buffer between the two sides. Soon as they pulled out, Turkey said it would invade, and that's exactly what's taking place right now. We're not on the brink of a humanitarian crisis here. We're now in the middle of it. And unless this bombardment stops, unless the international community responds, then it's only going to get worse. And the people who are suffering are not the militaries are not the politicians, they're the people who call this home. Ian Panel, ABC News in northern Syria. All right. Thank you, Ian. Um, very dangerous there also. So now we turn to that explosive new book from Ronan Farrow. Um, his bombshell reporting earned Ronan Farrow a Pulitzer Prize. And now in his new book, he names names and reveals sources from his investigation of Harvey Weinstein. It reads like a Hollywood script of espionage and sabotage, a high-stakes game of whack-a-mole where spies, investigators, and Weinstein allies allegedly worked clandestinely to silence witnesses, ruin reputations and intimidate whistleblowers. So our Lindsay Davis has the report. Lindsay. In Ronan Farrow's upcoming new book, Catch and Kill, the investigative reporter details what he says were powerful attempts to stifle the reporting that ultimately sparked the explosive scandal and the Me Too movement. In August of 2017, Farrow says he thought he had enough of a story, including secretly recorded audio of Weinstein provided by an alleged victim willing to be named, Ambra Gutierrez. Yesterday was a kind of aggressive for me. I'm and yesterday you touched my breast. Oh, come on, I'm used to that. Farrow also says he had an accuser in shadow, anonymous corroborating witnesses, and he believed he could convince some accusers to go on the record. But instead of airing the story or encouraging more reporting, Farrow writes he was told by NBC News executives to pause on all reporting, cancel interviews. And according to Farrow, NBC News President Noah Oppenheim questioned whether Harvey Weinstein's comments on the tape were even newsworthy, reportedly saying, I don't know what it proves. He is trying to get rid of her. People say a lot of things when they're trying to get rid of a girl like that. Harvey Weinstein grabbing a lady's breasts a couple of years ago, that's not national news. Farrow kept going, ultimately taking his reporter to the New Yorker magazine. Farrow says he was told by Noah Oppenheim that he could take it elsewhere, saying, right now we can't run this. Go with God. The story won a Pulitzer Prize.
This week, in a memo to NBC News staff, Chairman Andy Lack maintained that when Farrow presented his reporting to NBC, he didn't have one victim or witness on the record, saying Farrow simply didn't have a story that met our standard for broadcast. Then, with the Me Too movement in full swing, another stunning fall. Good morning, breaking news overnight. Matt Lauer fired for what NBC said was sexual misconduct. The former NBC employee behind the complaint, Brooke Nevels, spoke out to Farrow for the first time, accusing Lauer in graphic detail of raping her in a hotel room while at the 2014 Sochi Olympics on assignment as Meredith Vieira's producer. In an open letter this week, Lauer adamantly denies the allegation, saying it was mutual and completely consensual and calling Nevels a fully enthusiastic and willing partner, going on to have several more consensual sexual encounters at his New York City apartment and his office at 30 Rock until ending what he called an affair. Farrow says Nevels acknowledges the encounters, and this week she responded to Lauer, saying his statement was classic victim shaming and saying the shame in this story belongs to him. All right, so an NBC spokesperson um, told us this week in a statement, they said, Matt Lauer's conduct was appalling, horrific, and reprehensible, as we said at the time. That's why he was fired within 24 hours of first learning of the complaint. Our hearts break again for our colleague. And ABC uh, News' chief uh, anchor, George Stephanopoulos, sat down with the author, uh, Ronan Farrow. The book is titled Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to Protect Predators. Um, and this was his first television interview so take a quick look let's start out with that denial from Matt Lauer he uh, detailed an angry denial he calls your story categorically false that this was a consensual affair the accusation of rape is defamatory designed to sell a book and obviously in the book we include his exact thinking without violating any ground rules. We had very strict rules about what we could reveal about what conversations we had with many of the sources in the book. Uh, the thinking of every person against whom a serious allegation is made is fully represented Did in you this talk book. To so Matt there's Lauer? nothing new there. Again, I can't answer specific questions about that, but I can say that Matt Lauer's thinking that's presented in this letter is in the book. And I think this young woman, this journalist, Brooke Nevels, presents what I found to be a persuasive response to that. The facts of her case, which are backed by documentation and eyewitnesses, suggest that there was an encounter here that she consistently has described as non-consensual. And she says, regardless of what happened before and after that, and how we interpreted that, she said no to a physical act. So if he or his allies were to say that you did in fact check those claims, extensively fact-checked, as with everything in this book. And I want to get into that the subtitle right there, Lies and Spies, because one of the things you document in the book is this dark world uh, that Harvey Weinstein entered to intimidate news organizations from reporting on him, including spying on you. Harvey Weinstein hired former Mossad agents with a firm called Black Cube, who in turn hired contractors who surveilled me, tracked me, uh, built dossiers on both me and survivors of alleged assault by Harvey Weinstein to try to squash this story. A friend, a friend told you you had to think about buying a gun? I was told by sources to buy a gun. I moved out of my home. And here's the thing. I, I say all this and report it in detail in the book, not to be woe is me, but to illustrate the threats to the free press in this country. We are at a moment where powerful people are able to subvert the media, law, and the free press and that is a threat to our democracy. And around the world, the stakes are even higher. Journalists get killed for reporting stories. It's got to stop, and we have to protect this precious institution. It has not stopped potential witnesses, people who have stories to tell from throwing things over your transom? I have a lot of sources coming in all the time, and I am so grateful for that. I'm able to tell this story, which is ultimately, George, I think, an uplifting story. There's a lot of dark in it, but there's also a lot of brave people coming forward and saying, enough, this has got to stop. All right, so you can see more of that interview um, online. And guys, if you didn't know, today, October 11th, is National Coming Out Day. Why October 11th? It's the anniversary of the National March on Washington in 1987 for lesbian and gay rights. And it's now observed annually to increase awareness for the community because coming out is a deeply personal decision and there's no right or wrong way to do it if a person chooses to do it at all. And that definitely depends on the person's um, circumstances. So 
the Trevor Project just released a new handbook to support LGBTQ young people to explore what coming out safely can mean for them. And I'm very happy to be joined by Amit Paley, the CEO of the Trevor Project. And we also have Dr. D from our ABC Medical Unit. Um, so guys, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Amit, I want to start with you. Uh, the handbook is out, um, but you say it's definitely not meant to be prescriptive. What do you mean by that? Well, there is no one right way to come out. If people are going to come out at all, if there are people who are coming out, we want to celebrate them and support them. We also want to make sure there are many people who are not in a position where they are ready to come out or want to come out. They might be in a place where it is dangerous to do so. They might be at a time where they're not quite ready to share that with everyone or they want to share it with some people in their community. And we want everyone to know that their identity is valid. So if you are an LGBTQ young person who is ready to come out, we support you. If you're an LGBTQ young person who hasn't come out, we support you too. And we also want to make sure that young people know Sometimes people think, well, there are gay and lesbian people and there are trans people who are male or female. And we want people to know those are all valid and true identities. There are also a lot more identities. There are people who are non-binary. There are people who are bisexual. There are people with many, many other types of sexual orientations and gender identities. And we want young people to feel comfortable exploring and understanding who they truly are and being proud and affirming of their identities in however they want to express it. I love that, like the handbook is really all encompassing. And you talked about that a lot, like saying that um, the coming out process is not just about being lesbian or gay. Absolutely not. Coming out can refer to anybody who has been struggling with something, they haven't been forthcoming with it, and now, for whatever reason, they are deciding. This can specifically refer to anybody with chronic health problems. In mental health, this is a particular problem, people with schizophrenia, for example, and then they're deciding to now disclose the information because they're afraid of the identity that is attached with that. But I agree with everything that was said that these individuals should feel confident and even more validated because they have the confidence to be themselves and who they want to be. And one thing I really love about the handbook is that it's for LGBTQ youth, but I feel like it's an education for everyone, really, because you really break down all of these terms that people may not be familiar with, like gender identity, sexual orientation, the difference in those things. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because yeah. Sexual orientation is who you are uh, attracted to, um, and your gender identity is who you are, your, in your innate sense of what your gender identity is. And sometimes people don't understand those, and sometimes people understand them, but they think of them in really binary ways. Yeah. And we, it's so important right now because young people are so much more comfortable now and open and being supportive in understanding that gender identity and sexual orientation, they are not a binary. You can be anywhere on the spectrum. You mm -hmm. can be off the spectrum. You can be an asexual person. Yeah. You can be an agender person. And so we really need to be teaching the broader community about how young people are identifying because that is how they're going to get the support and love that they deserve so they can thrive and be their true selves. Yeah, the, the support is what I want to talk about because there's an interesting stat um, that your team had sent. It says um, that just one accepting adult can decrease the risk of the LGBTQ youth attempting suicide by 40%, just one adult. Mm -hmm. That's staggering to think that some yeah. kids or teenagers may not have that. So the support um, is crucial. It's critical, and we, I mean, at the Trevor Project, we run crisis service programs for young people who reach out to us via phone, via text, and via chat. And we hear from a lot of young people who don't have any support in their lives. And part of what we are there for often is we are there to be that supportive person, to let them know that there might not be someone at this moment in their life or in their community who is supporting them, but that there are many, many people in the world who will not only see them and love them and support them, but be proud of them for being who they are. And so we really hope that people understand the importance of this statistic, because when you think about what that means, that just one person, you just being one person, mm -hmm supporting someone and saying, I see you, I love you, you are beautiful the way that you are, 
that can save lives. And we hope that people, regardless of what their political beliefs may be, yeah. understand the importance of sending those messages of love and support can be life-saving. And just before we go, I just want you to hit us very quickly because sure. uh, I think it's no coincidence that, um, or I think it's great that National Coming Out Day is right after uh, World Mental Health Day. Yep. What are some of the symptoms um, that people can look for uh, in a person if they're sure. you know, going through something? First off, I'd like to say I agree with everything that was said. In psychiatry, the coming out period is well known to be associated with one of the highest risk periods for attempted and completed suicide. We really look for whether or not the person has attempted suicide before. Self-injury, so cutting or cigarette burns, is a huge risk factor. So you can, for example, look for someone in the summer months, say, wearing a jacket. Um, people with these self-injury behaviors, are those are signs and symptoms that you can pick up that someone might be in trouble and need help. And uh, Amit, uh, Trevor Project has a number of resources that people can tap into, which is why the organization is so good. So tell us about those. Yes. Yeah, so for any young people who are watching right now who need support or need someone to talk to, you can reach out to us by phone on our 24-7 phone lifeline. You can reach out to us via text or chat, which are also available now 24-7. We run the world's largest safe space social networking site for LGBTQ youth, and we have a lot of resources on our website, www.thetrevor.com project.org, which includes um, our coming out, a handbook for LGBTQ youth. So we want young people to know that they are beautiful the way they are, that they are deserving of love and respect, and most importantly, that they are never alone. Amazing. Great um, message. Dr. D, amazing Great. message. Um, Amit, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. And guys, some of our own ABC News family get, uh, shared their coming out stories, so you can check those out online. And if you're around, you can stick around for the briefing room at 3.30 p.m. and then check out World News Prime at 8 p.m. And if you want to stay updated on all of these headlines, you can go to abcnews.com or download the app. Thank you guys for being thank here. You for and you guys us. have a good weekend. We'll see you next week.